The power of the human heart is so deeply acknowledged in many indigenous traditions uh, that there is uh, uh, one tradition in Mesoamerica from a tribe that's actually called the Kogi. The Kogi so deeply emphasize the power and the significance of our relationship to our hearts that when their children are born, for the, the first couple of years of their lives, the children are kept almost in completely darkened conditions and kept separate from the physicality of the world around them so that the world that they develop first is the inner knowing of their heart before they develop the perceptions of the world around them. And in doing that, as, as the basis, then they are exposed to the sensuality of the physical world around them uh, and other people around them. And their orientation is so very, very different. Now, many people in the West, when we hear that, it, it sounds very strange to us. Some people think it may actually sound cruel. But the, the net result of the way that these young people begin to live is their entire frame of reference becomes heart-based. And that is the perspective from which they begin to experience their world rather than their minds discounting the power of the heart. And I'm not suggesting that we need to deprive ourselves of the physical world to have the experience. What I am saying is I think there are things that we can encourage in our young people early in our lives and now as adults that we can learn for ourselves to cultivate and develop what is called the heart intelligence, this power of our hearts to inform us of relationships, of experiences in the world that we simply cannot perceive through our, our mind alone. And I think this, uh, again, I think it's, it's one of the great frontiers. There's an organization uh, in Northern California, a pioneering research organization that has been formed specifically to explore the power of the human heart in very unconventional ways. And it is called the Institute of Heart Math. I'm not an employee of HeartMath, but I have known these people almost since their inception, since the early 90s. We've worked together on some, some very, very powerful projects. They are scientists, engineers, medical doctors, computer scientists, physicists, uh, academics from many different careers that have left those careers to pool their resources for the sole purpose of exploring the power of the human heart in ways that we have never explored in the West in modern science in the past. We all know that the heart can pump blood, for example, but you can build a machine to pump the blood. What we're finding, what heart math is now finding is that, that may be the least of what the heart does. The heart does so much more than simply pump blood. And we're only beginning to understand, for example, what the people at the Institute of Heart Math have documented as scientific fact published in peer reviewed journals is the fact that the human heart is surrounded by a field of energy. It's electrical energy and it's magnetic energy. You can measure it with conventional equipment if it's tuned properly. This field is called a torus, a tube torus. It looks essentially like a donut that extends from the physical heart into the world around us for a distance of about five to eight feet. And I asked one of the primary researchers, I said, this field is so powerful. Why does it stop at five feet or, or eight feet? And he said, ah, he said, that's the limitation of my equipment. He said, if we had better equipment, what the equipment is showing is that the heart field probably extends for a distance of many, many miles. On the physical level, on the quantum level, he said it's probably infinite because it's very difficult to, tear, to tell where this electrical and magnetic field ends in the quantum field. Well, the value of knowing this what it says to us is if we're in a room with hundreds of people and we're all within five to eight feet of one another, we may be physically separate, but we are sharing a heart field. And the longer we're in that room together, the more our fields begin to meld together. There is a relationship between the heart and the brain where the two organs may tune to one another in a very specific way. Uh, I've mentioned earlier that it is the signal from the heart to the brain that tells the brain what kind of chemistry to release into the body. What I didn't say is that the quality of that signal uh, is called coherence. So when we have what is called a high coherence between the heart and the brain, which can be measured, it's quantified, it's a very, very low frequency, 0 0.10 hertz is optimum coherence. 
If we can create a feeling in our hearts that generates 0.10 hertz between our heart and our brain, we are now in optimum coherence. And what that means is that we're functioning, op functioning optimally, that this is the best signal that we can create. And in, in this way, this is where our brain now is releasing powerful chemistry into our bodies. Super immune response comes from 0.10 hertz. There's a new science you know, that's called epigenetics. Epigenetics means above genetics. It means there's something happening above our DNA that influences the DNA. What the studies are showing is that human emotion, heart-based emotion, is one of the signals that literally influences the DNA in our bodies. Uh, it is uh, now very well noted uh, that longevity is directly linked to these feelings, for example. And many of the systems in the body that seem mysterious to us, and we're looking for chemicals and drugs to turn those systems on. What the studies are showing is that emotion is a signal that will enable those systems. For example, aging. We know that in the aging process, every time the cell divides, uh, at the end of the DNA, there are uh, portions of DNA that are called telomeres or telomeres. They're pronounced both ways. Uh, they become brittle as we go through the aging process. And each time the cell divides, a little bit of that telomere is no longer able to reproduce. It breaks off it, It's uh, because it is brittle. And when it breaks off enough times, it can't reproduce. That's what we call the aging process in the cell. Well, interestingly, our bodies have an enzyme that is designed to heal and to repair those telomeres. It is called telomerase. And the question has been, how do we activate telomerase? And what has been found is that it is the quality of emotion between the heart and the brain that literally can, can activate the telomerase and have a, a, a direct impact upon the aging of our bodies. So the question is, what kinds of emotions create those kinds of effects? They're the emotions that our mother has always told us about and that our most cherished traditions have always said, positive heart-based emotions such as care, such as gratitude, such as appreciation, compassion. Those are the kinds of experiences that we may have in our hearts that literally give our bodies a new lease on life. The chemistry responds to those. Our indigenous ancestors knew it, but it wasn't science. Our own science is bearing it out. So this is one example of where there is a knowledge from our past. It's ancient, it's not obsolete. And I think it has direct bearing on where we're going with our studies today. If we can marry the wisdom of the past with the best science of today, marry them together into something that's greater than the science all by itself and greater than the spiritual traditions all by themselves. Marry these two great ways of knowing together into a wisdom that maybe has not been in this world for a very long time. That gives us the edge, the evolutionary edge to deal with the crises that we are faced with in our world that maybe our ancestors didn't have. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm so optimistic about where we're going because of the willingness to embrace the wisdom of the past and honor the best science of our time today.